This is Barbara Slavin. It's September 11th, 1998. I'm at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, and I'm interviewing John Bass. Uh, Mr. Bass, could you just tell me for the record what is your full name? John Joseph Bass, okay. Senior. Okay. And may I ask you how old you are? Ninety. Ninety. And your address? In Natick. Mm -hmm. And your uh, marital status? Married. Mm -hmm. Do you have any children? One. Okay. And may I ask where you were born? New York City. Oh. And were you raised in New York City? New York City and not across the river from New Jersey. Uh, when, did, when did you come to Natick? About 16, 17 years ago. Okay. Uh, have you noticed in the last 16, 17 years that Natick has changed much? Oh, yes. <laughs> Could you tell me how it's changed? Well, the building has been going on like mad, like yeah. uh, this new uh, public service set up in the library and all that. Yeah. Quite an improvement. Yeah. Has it changed? Has the town changed for the better? Oh, yes. the worse? Okay. Could you tell me about your own family background? Well, my f parents came from Czechoslovakia about 1900 or so. And uh, how they met, I have no idea, but they finally got married. We had, uh, I had a sister who died at age four, four when I was two. Mm -hmm. My mother took me over to Europe to uh, visit with the family after the death of my sister. And, uh, but I don't remember a thing about that. Other than that, everything is the same. When and, uh, when and where did you enter the military? In uh, 19, June of 1942, in West New York, New Jersey. It's just across the river from New York. And what branch of the service were you in? Army. Mm -hmm. And may I ask you why you chose the Army? <laughs> I had no choice. <laughs> No, I, what happened there was I wanted to enlist and uh, I had the crazy idea that you had to check with your draft board to uh, get permission to enlist. Mm -hmm. So I did and they, <laughs> he said they had too many rejects and they gave me a letter called to whom are they concerned? I was drafted. I didn't even have that 10 days, uh, in three days I was in. What, uh, what do you mean you had too many rejections? What is that? You said he, he said you had too many rejections. What does oh, that they mean? had too many rejections on their own uh, quotas. Oh. So even at 36 or 35, I was still qualified. Did your friends join the Army? Um, most of the fellows that I worked with, that worked for me, uh, joined. That's why I was getting kind of jittery, and I decided I'd better join too. What was your profession at that time? What was my what? what? What did you do? For oh, I was head of a chemical and physical testing laboratory for the Western Electric Company, Bell System. And did you enjoy your job? Oh, yes. I started out as uh, office boy. I'm on up ahead of the laboratory, so that was, wasn't too bad. Excellent. Could you tell me about your basic training? Oh, that again was a mistake. Uh, I was assigned to uh, the 76th Division, which is New England Division, in basic training. And uh, since I was with the Western Electric Company, they decided I was communications. Mm -hmm. All I knew about communication was telephone. You lift up the receiver, answer it, and so on. Uh, I spent, I guess, four or five weeks learning the Morse code going crazy. I never used it. Never had saw anybody use it in the army, but I had four weeks of it. And that was it. And then, of course, regular training for physical fitness and you know, handling guns. And what, and I did all right then. I was promoted pretty quickly to corporal. When did you first, 
become involved with World War II? On the Jungle Bus Electric Company was sole, sole uh, supplier of material mm. for the Army before the war. Mm. How about when you first went um, overseas? <laughs> I was a replacement officer then. Mm -hmm. I, after, after graduating from OCS in Georgia, exactly one year from the day I was inducted, I was on board ship heading for North Africa. Mm -hmm. I was bombed around North Africa for about two months before I was assigned to the 45th Division at the end of the Sicilian campaign mm -hmm. and got ready for the invasion of Italy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the invasion? <laughs> That's another silly thing. We were uh, supposed to be in reserve, but uh, the 36th Division was taking quite a beating, and we were rushed into action as a, a mm -hmm. reserve or not. And of course, our LCI, which is a troop carrying boat, got stranded on a sandbar about 100 yards offshore. <laughs> so they had to put a, a chain of something, a boat zigzagging back and forth, and unload us until they could move the ship. And that was, I'm trying to remember the date, the invasion of Italy. Well, that would be on the record somewhere, but I don't remember the exact date. Well, what, uh, what was it Salerno? Yes, below Salerno. The first, place. was that your first invasion? At a place called Paestum. Right. Were you involved in Anzio as well? Oh, yes. After I got hurt, uh, I was rehabilitated and... Uh, sent to a rehabilitation camp, and I got bored at the camp, and I took off and rejoined my outfit, which was then up in Anzio. Mm -hmm. And my knee wouldn't hold up, it kept caving in all the time, and my sergeant decided to complain to com company commander, he's killing himself, so mm -hmm. back I went to the hospitals again. Do you have but I was at Anzio for about three weeks. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me what it was like in Anzio? Oh, jeez. It was quiet where we, were, where we were at the time. It was kind of a lull, but you could hear the shells coming from one, both sides. Our shells going over there, their shells coming over here. And all we did was scouting work, and that's, that's about the, the extent. The real battle came in afterward. Were you on the beaches, or did you go into the, um, the mountain, the countryside? Oh, we, the beach was just the beginning. You, right. hit, you hit, hit inside as quickly as you could to get back away from the shore where they could see you and spot you and shoot you pretty well. And they had two big guns over there the Germans had in the mountains. It took us a long time to get rid of those things. Mm. What sort of uh, weapons did you carry? Uh, we had a choice. As an officer, we had a choice of rifles and stuff, but I preferred uh, a carbine, which is a lot easier to handle than a rifle and much more effective than a pistol. So. And what size carb carbine would that be? What millimeter? Uh, 30, 30. 30 caliber. Right. They talk a lot about the weather uh, in Anzio. Could you tell me what the weather was like? No problem. Not, no problem. Not that I remember. Okay. None. It rained, of course, uh, occasionally, but uh, it wasn't that bad. Did you get to uh, meet any of the uh, Local Italian people? Yes, but uh, <laughs> they were just chiselers, just tr scrounging. They were hurt badly, you know, and lost everything. They were right. just scrounging around mm -hmm. to get all they could uh, from the GIs. And we gave them whatever we could spare, mm -hmm. but there wasn't too much. Could you tell me what a day uh, in Italy would be like where there was no combat, what, what you would do in your off time? Well, as, as combat troops, there was no really off time. You get relief from uh, actual combat duty mm -hmm. and back, uh, brought back to uh, a safer area, mm -hmm. but then it was drilling again. You practice again for mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you were in, in good shape for returning to combat. And it was never steady. Uh, you could be there for a week, or you could be there for two days, and off you go again, you know. But training back, and there's no uh, really relaxation time. We'd have, occasionally, they bring up a movie or something, but that's mm. all. Do you remember any of the movies? What is that? Do you remember any movie that, in particular that you mm. saw? Not really. Yeah. 
How is the uh, supply of uh, food? Very good. Yeah. We had uh, sea rations, which were fair. I mean, they came up with a new one, K rations, which are much better, but yeah. uh, there's stuff you had to prepare in the field by yourself. Yeah. Did you find that when you uh, were in the Army that you got to meet uh, different types of Americans that you might not have met at home? Oh, yes. Yeah. All kinds, different nationalities, but all, yeah. all, all Americans, all American-born, right. but different nationalities. Yeah. And how, how would you say you all got along? Fine. Yeah. We're all in the same boat. Yeah. Of course, as, a, as an officer, I never was given to giving a lot of orders. I treated the other fellows just yeah. the same as they would treat me. Yeah. But uh, in, in cases where... Uh, it demanded some real strict attention. I would be tough enough to mm -hmm. prove I was an officer, but yeah. I try to be on a level with mm -hmm. the men. I always had a good reputation with the men. What was the hardest part about being an officer? Sending somebody out for combat, or not for combat necessarily, but for scouting or something. Mm -hmm. You had to pick them out. You'd much rather go yourself, but you were not permitted. Could you just... But other than that, it uh, wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me um, just a, a little brief history of the history of your progression of your rank uh, from uh, private to from draftee to captain? Well, I was assigned to, as I said before, I was assigned to the 76th Division in Fort Meade, Maryland, mm -hmm. as the advance, part of the advance party. And we had, uh, what we did was relieve all the officers and non-coms there from their dirty duties, and we did them for about two weeks before the regular troops came in. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we ran in seventh heaven. We didn't have to do anything after that, uh, except do a, a job like communications or whatever we were involved in. Uh, I got to be corporal. I was on a list to be uh, sergeant. But they came out with uh, a request for volunteers for OCS, Officer Candidate School. Mm -hmm. And I figured for my job, I was probably best qualified for quartermaster, engineers, or something like that. But those quotas are very small, so I went to the took the infantry, mm -hmm. which I figured I could always transfer to someplace else. What a mistake that it was. Once in the infantry, you are in the infantry, period. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went to OCS. I did very well there. Uh, they didn't tell me exactly where I finished, but I was finished in the f top five in my class, mm -hmm. which was not bad. From there, I was assigned to Camp Croft in South Carolina, where we were supposed to replace the regular officers while they went assigned to combat duty. But they s pulled a dirty trick, and they s moved all of us out. <laughs> and next thing I knew, I was uh, Heading for Shenango in Pennsylvania, where for last minute training. And then uh, I remember I <clears throat> was going to get married before I, I didn't want to get married before I left with the Army because I figured um, if I come back, fine. If I didn't come back, fine. But if I came back crippled, she'd be stuck with me. So, I, <laughs> But we had, I managed to get a week off. I wired my wife to be to shoot the works or get married. Two days before we to leave, all leaves canceled. We wound up at uh, Camp Joyce Kilmer in Jersey, mm -hmm. where we had a bunch of troops to, to train and get ready for overseas shipment. And uh, I think I had about. In a week that we were there, I mean, we had about 15, 20 hours of sleep. We worked all the time. Then I, then I gave us a day off on, fr on Saturday to mm -hmm. go, go home. Those that lived in the area would go home. And the rest would get the day off on Sunday. So I managed to get home and see my wife-to-be. <laughs> that was the dullest time. I was falling asleep on her all the time. So back to camp and... <laughs> As I said before, exactly one day from the one year from the day I was inducted, I was on board ship heading for overseas. And that was 
we didn't know it at the time, but we wound up in Oran in North Africa. And from Iran, we moved to Bizerdi, and at Bizerdi, after about two months of playing around, doing nothing, I was assigned to the 45th Division in, just as the Sicilian campaign was closing. And I, <coughs> I wound up with some pretty damn good troops, mm. which made me look good, too. And then, of course, came the invasion of Italy. Did you come into contact with the British troops? Oh, yes. That was in Italy. Right. <laughs> they were funny. Uh, we were moving up from on the uh, west coast of Italy, and they were coming up from the southern part of Italy, from the leg boot up the east coast. And it seems they wouldn't move until every blade of grass was down. They, they just killed everything off as they went along, to make sure everything was done. And we had to wait for them. That's got to be quite a nuisance. <coughs> But the toughest troops I ever saw <coughs> were the uh, Japanese Nisis, the Japanese battalion that they had there for, uh, they were terrific. There's no question about it. Where were the Japanese? Italy. They had a whole battalion, a division, I think it's a 442nd combat unit, all Japanese with, Amer with uh, white officers. But their reputation was fantastic. Oh, you mean our? Our troops. No, yeah. our Japanese. Yeah, our Japanese. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. <laughs> but they were fantastic. But then, I, other than that, I, I remember being scared stiff and all, but still managed to do what I was supposed to do. Did you, uh, were you involved in the liberation of Rome? No. Uh, I was uh, hurt in a <clears throat> during the casino line. They held us up at the casino, and we were out, off to a place called Venafro, a steep hill with us on one side and the enemy on the other, I guess. And down below, we had these anti tank guns that uh, they used to keep the guns level or pointed down so that uh, they wouldn't get any moisture in them. Mm. And you get an air raid, and they start shooting right through our position. <laughs> And we sent more men uh, to the hospital from there than we did uh, mm. from the enemy fire. But uh, I got hurt when uh, I was up above my foxhole. The only foxhole I ever dug, four feet deep, another officer. And I was up on the hill overlooking something, making sure, and I'm looking, <coughs> running down toward my foxhole when the shooting started. And without looking where I was going, it seemed all my men were under cover. And I hit something about knee high. And I did the only cartwheel that I ever did in my life. <laughs> and landed on one leg in the foxhole. That was the end of my fighting career. Mm. That thing blew up like a balloon. And mm. I wound up after, in, back in North Africa for surgery and recovered from that partly. And then back to uh, Ansio, as I said, back to the hospitals and reassigned to rear echelon duty by did the best I could. Was your contact with the Germans from a distance or oh, I hand, never saw I never saw a German. Were you um, do you remember the Luftwaffe or do you remember ground from the distance? Did you oh, were you we aware of them? Uh, we were never close enough to each other to see each other, but remember the Luftwaffe of course right. the planes would come over air raids regularly and our boys would take turns going after them. But uh, as far as the only Germans I saw were those that were captured, and we got them in prison, that's all. Mm. But never any personal contact with the German soldiers. Were you able to uh, keep abreast of the war in the rest of the world, in the Pacific, and in Northern Europe while you were in Italy? No. Did you, no. You, they didn't, you didn't know how the war was going? We had, uh, well, we'd get a periodic uh, reports but when you're in combat, you don't get this stuff. You're interested only in what you're doing, your particular f area that you're interested in. And uh, you go back to rear echelon for, for a break or something like that, rest period or something like that way. Then you find out something that was going on. But that, even that was kind of light. How did um, your fellow soldiers and officers feel about the cause that they were fighting for? 
I had never heard any complaints. They were all fighting because they wanted to. They thought they were fighting a good cause. I have never heard a criticism of that. I've heard an officer criticizing another officer for the way he was acting, but that's about the only criticism I ever heard. Did you ever hear um, propaganda radio? Uh, we heard, uh, we didn't have much chance to see the radio, hear the radios, but oh, Sally, what the heck was her name? Sally the Berlin bitch, I think they called her. Mm -hmm. She used to come on the air and uh, she would say the damnedest yeah. things uh, about the American troops, what they, were happy, what they were getting involved in, you're gonna get killed and yeah. all this other stuff. But I heard that maybe twice. Yeah. I used to hear some people talk about Lord Ha Ha, the English Never trader who was on the radio. Yeah. After, um, so after your injury in Italy, you had no more active combat. Is that right? Mm. And, but what was the rest of your career like in the Army after that? Well, I was assigned to rear echelon duty with the replacement depot, mm -hmm. which uh, <clears throat> at this time was while the war still on, we were supplying new troops to, uh, fresh troops to, the, uh, to replace the, those that were injured, killed. And later, they, uh, we wound up sending troops home. And that was quite a job, watch, sending all these boys home and you're sitting there <laughs> yourself, you couldn't go anywhere. <coughs> you're sending them home, um, why were you sending them home? Because the war was winding the war down? Was over, yeah. Okay. But uh, as I said before, this one case, uh, uh, when the war was over in Europe, the war was still on in Japan, and the troops all felt they were going home, but I had to stand there and tell them that they weren't, which was, oh, <laughs> I still showed what they could have done to me. But I got a good hand when, they fin when I finished, so. Yeah. But they had a shipload of uh, troops leaving our place ready to go to, uh, to Japan. And that was stopped because the war in Japan ended about the same time. What sort of discipline problems did you have with your men? Very little. I, none that I remember. I had one case uh, when I just joined the uh, 45th Division in Sicily where <clears throat> I told my sergeant since I've I'm green at this stuff here. I haven't been doing anything like, anything like this for a while. You're in charge, and I'll back you up and everything you do. And he got one guy that uh, uh, caused some sort of a problem and sentenced him to some kind of duty that was extra. And, and the guy came to me and wanted uh, to be relieved of this duty. I said, no, he's sit. So he looks at me and he says, when we get in combat, I'll get you. I said, you better make that first one count because you're gonna look like a sieve when I get a chance to get. Mm -hmm. And my sergeant wanted to put him in, the, you know, have him uh, for uh, court martial for some mm -hmm. uh, assassin. You know, I said, never mind. We need him. We need every man we need for the, for the uh, army. Eventually, he he ran away. We never uh, did find him. He deserted. Yeah, he deserted. Yeah. So when you. Uh May I ask you what your homecoming was like when you returned from overseas? Well, that was a kind of a pleasant surprise. Uh, the ship we were told was heading for Norfolk, uh, Virginia. But somewhere en route, they changed their plans. They drove up the Hudson River, my country, past New York City. And from there, we parked discharged at a camp uh, and sent back to Jersey, Camp Monmouth in Jersey, where my family came down to pick me up, my wife-to-be and everybody else. It's quite a homecoming. How were you treated? Well, well, I assume. Oh, yeah. <laughs> beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. I, was a, I was a homecoming hero. <laughs> Meantime, my brother had, uh, youngest brother had, uh, become an officer in the chemical warfare division and uh, he was home before me so he was part of the group that welcomed me home too. How did you feel about um, the Vietnam vets when they came home who did not get a good um, 
necessarily get I a good felt reception. Sorry for them. Yeah. I thought they took a beating that they didn't deserve. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was kind of a half civilian, half military man, and uh, I thought they took an awful beating. Mm -hmm. It was unfair. Mm -hmm. And why was it unfair? Well, they were involved in a war that uh, nobody wanted, mm. except whoever said started this thing business, and uh, they were drawing on military pay and all this sort of stuff. And the people were saying, "Ah, there's uh, wasting money and uh, baloney." They they did the best they could while well, they were there. As a matter of fact, they had it tough for them. We did. Mm. How do you feel your um, experience in the war changed you? I don't think it changed me very much anyway, in any direction because mm -hmm. I was a uh, supervisor of, of people in, in the laboratory and then in the army, of course, and after I came out of the army, the company took me back and promoted me and all this sort of stuff. And so I don't think it changed me very much. Mm -hmm. It might have, but uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know about it. You, I used you feel proud of what you did in the war. Oh, yes, so, definitely. Yeah. I wasn't a hero, but I wasn't a coward either. <laughs> but you didn't have a chance uh, to be really scared. You, had, you were in charge of a group of men, 30, 40, 50, 60 men, depending on what, mm -hmm. how big your unit was. And you had to worry about them. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that they were all, all well taken care of. There were officers that didn't do that, of course, but mm -hmm. I always felt that these guys were my responsibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I rated very well with all the troops I ever served mm -hmm. with. It must have been hard if you lost anyone. The what? The, losing a, a soldier must have been hard for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Did you have to write home to their parents or their family? I only did that once. Yeah. But I, when I was in the hospital the second time, uh, we had a lot of uh, men in the hospital writing letters home, and we, and as officers, we had a sense of the mail. And some of these, some of these guys working in medics, as medics at uh, in the hospitals, in safe, good con uh, surroundings, griping like heck about the living conditions and everything else. Boy, I had more of them up on the carpet. For God's sake, how about the poor slobs that are on the front? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the only problem I ever had in, in the army. And of course, I had a problem with my company commander, <laughs> Playboy. Oh. <laughs> he just saddled me with everything until finally I had a tough colonel, regular army colonel. Yeah. And after this, this captain had just beating the brains out, take my jeep that I used to uh, carry orders around and everything else, and now Playboy. So I finally said to the company commander, the colonel, sir, I'd like a transfer. He looks at me and says, Captain Brown? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> he says, keep your shirt on, I'll take care of it. He did. <laughs> How did this fellow being a playboy affect you? Uh, was he neglect ne neglecting his duties? And oh, no, he them? just gave me more duties to do. Right. Everything that he was supposed to do, I won't do doing. doing. Right. But uh, the next day, the company, uh, this captain comes in to say, what the hell are you trying to do, get me court martial? I said, good idea. He <laughs> says, the colonel says, from now on, I have to ask you to do something. I can't tell you to do something. <laughs> so after that, it was all right. But the other night, I had no problems, really. <clears throat> I was curious as to what sort of things you would censor. You said you censored people's mail, uh, soldiers' mail. What sort of things would you censor out? Oh, anything that had to do with combat information. Right. For instance, uh, the guy says, "I fresh guy just in the hospital. We were at such and such a place yesterday. Well, you don't write that. That's military information. Yeah. And also certain things that, uh, certain gripes that you didn't want the public to know about right. because they were mostly imaginary, you know. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, is there a thought or a memory that you'd like to share with the community about 
your experiences in the World War II that you maybe think people might misunderstand that you'd like oh, to share with my, people? Uh, I had nothing to say about that, but after I got married and we moved into a small town in Jersey, I joined the American Legion under pressure from local uh, people. And uh, I got annoyed a second with them. All they wanted was bonus, bonus, bonus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt, as a, as a male member of the country, and a female member too, you had a duty to this country that's not replaced with money. And I fought against these. <laughs> and I, I finally quit the uh, American Legion because of that. Now, they've, been, they've done a lot of good work since, of course, but, uh, but at, the, at that time, I was madder than heck. Mm. As a matter of fact, they had a, uh, uh, oh, a vote to give each soldier so much uh, of a raise. Now, everybody, regardless of whether he was in combat or not, <laughs> he'd get the same amount. See? And I was against this completely. I voted against it, and I went around uh, pro uh, talking against this thing as much as I could. Oh, but I didn't rate it all after that. I was persona non grata. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that attitude of, of it being an honor to serve more typical of your generation? I would say so. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, uh, a boss on the job whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower. They came from Vermont, and he just rubbed that in. And he felt he didn't have to serve in the armed forces because his, gener his ancestors did it for him. And this drove me crazy. He said, first generation Americans like you should serve. I wanted to serve anyway, but uh, this bothered me too. That's, I found that a bit annoying too. But other than that, uh, I was proud of it. And most of the fellows I've, yeah. I've talked to that were in the military service are proud of what they did. Would you say that, uh, I guess to, for posterity, is there anything that you think that people generally misunderstand about World War II that you'd like to straighten out? Or misunderstand about the Italian campaign or mm, Italy? I don't think there's anything about the campaigns that... Uh, I didn't like the attitude the Germans had, of course, uh, this conquest that they were after. Mm. And I was run by a screwball by the name of Hitler, mm. and uh, that people just went for it. And that wasn't the first time that happened. The Germans did that three or four times before that, too. Mm. But uh, they calmed down a bit now, I think. And But this business of hate, this bothers me. Mm. I hate you because you're Jewish, or I hate you because you're black, and he hates me because I'm white, and so on. This is ridiculous. Mm. Well, but at 90, I don't probably don't have to do worry about that for too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> is there something else? If, if you have so much to say, is there something else about your wartime experiences or living in Natick that you'd like to share with us? Well, living in Natick has been very pleasant. Yeah. Uh, nothing exciting, of course, but uh, Good. Well. very pleasant. Yeah. And of course, I've been doing. We, uh, I started working uh, after the war. The company took me back in New York, uh, to where I served as a, on the staff. A good job. And then they decided that since I didn't have a degree, I. I had to get off the staff, so they made me a supervisor and transferred me up here to the Boston District out, mm -hmm. out of Watertown. And I had enough of that. I retired. I went to Florida for six, six years in Florida, which was nice, except even though I was old, I found there had too many old people down there that acted old, that yeah. had no life at all, you know, just talking about ailments and diseases and mm -hmm. deaths and this. This got my goat, and, I, and don't forget, there's a lot of nice people there too, of course. But uh, then my son's wife got sick, and he asked us to come up to join him. And he said, ah, it's a good time. Mm -hmm. After six years in uh, Florida, I sold the uh, mobile home we had, and we moved up here and joined him in Framingham. And 
that place got to be kind of small for us. So we joined our forces, our finances together, and bought a mm -hmm. house up here. And that's where I've been ever since about 17 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning to shake myself. I'm retired now for 28 years. Holy smokes. <laughs> well, you're doing very well. And I'm wondering if you have a can name a secret for your success because for someone your age you're very seem very fit and you're mentally very alert what would you say is different about you than other people who seem to go downhill I don't know uh, uh, I guess it would be attitude have some people just uh, they just give up and I don't think I gave up ever I'm, I'm not doing anything real silly or, or uh, difficult or special but uh, I've been mixed up at the uh, years ago with the Y uh, in New York, except 17 years at the Y, and wound up leadership there. And I, that's why I was in the Army. It was a good physical condition when I uh, joined the Army. And, and when we moved to this little town in Jersey, I got mixed up in local politics. So mm -hmm. I've had a pretty all around mm -hmm. uh, experience. Would you say you're a man? Uh, uh, of faith also? No. No? Okay. I don't go to church. Yeah. <clears throat> I've had too much history of church history that I'm not yeah. happy with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the things that are happening, again, uh, religion is, I think, is a beautiful thing, the most beautiful thing you could mm -hmm. think of. But it's run by human beings that just wacky. Mm -hmm. The Irish fighting the uh, the Catholics are fighting the Protestants. The, all through uh, Afri Africa, the, the uh, Tutsis or Tutsis are fighting so and so. It's all religious wars, and that's wrong. Why? Religion should be a good uh, peacemaking thing, but, it, but they're human. Hmm. What do you think is, what is your view of the future of this country? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I'm optimistic to a certain extent. I think it'll uh, keep on going, improving slightly each year for a while. Then like most of the big empires, it's almost like the Roman Empire it got mm -hmm. so, so big, it got too big for its own bridges mm -hmm. and collapsed. And I think we'll eventually we may do the same thing. But it's gonna take a long time, mm -hmm. I hope. Well, on that note, I think I'm going to close the interview. Oh, and you, thank, thank you. you for being such a wonderful um, interviewee. <laughs> and I want to thank you for your time. And uh, this is your last chance for your, if you have one more word to say uh, for posterity, this is your chance to say it. Behave. Behave. <laughs> well, that's a very good note. So on that note, I'm going to close the interview. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.